shrouds that go around these um, horizontal thrusters. And these horizontal thrusters allow the open ROV to drive through the water, both translate and rotate to make them go in different directions. And then on the top is the vertical thruster, and that's just a fan that pushes it down or pulls it up. Um, so with a combination of all three of these, you can basically go anywhere you want. You can't straight from side to side, but um, you know, it's kind of basic operation of the ROV can be achieved with these. Um, these two tubes on the bottom are battery packs. Um, right now they just hold non-rechargeable C batteries. Um, the design is that, or the, the, the thought behind that is that any expedition you go on where you're in the boondocks, you may not be able to get you know, power on shore, or you may not be able to um, recharge batteries. So this is something you can get at any hardware store, 7-Eleven, or whatever, and place them really quickly. Um, but we're also looking at ways that you can send power down and kind of triple charge on board chargeable batteries. Um, the mass of the batteries is um, exactly that to make the, the ROV neutrally buoyant. So it's designed to inherently not sink or float, just be slightly positive and add some weight. Um, and then having this weird shape, the reason for the shape of the ROV is that the, the mass of the batteries is moved forward to counterbalance the mass of the motors, which are aft of the buoyancy, which is centered. Um, and then the, the um, third thing is, um, I guess I did that, they, they add ballast, they add balance, um, and they add power. Um, and then here's the cool thing too, um, if you have electronics that you want to put in, if you have a payload that you're thinking of, if you're a hacker, um, this whole tube is where all your electronics are. So anything you can put in this tube, um, you can put on the ROV. Um, the end caps aren't laid down, we actually just laser cut them as well, they're these concentric discs that fit together. Um, we actually take a piece of a, an old medical syringe and you cut that off and that gives you a vent port. So when you're closing this off, you can equalize the pressure inside by pulling that piece of the syringe out and then you kind of do this and it, um, and it equalizes. This version that we have here is, um, it has an analog camera in it. Um, it's kind of one that we've been using for experimentation and we just control it around with kind of a hobby RC controller. Um, but obviously, if you've seen the if you've seen the videos and what we're working on, and, and this is really what Rand can talk a lot about, um, because he's really helped us develop it a lot, um, is we want this to be something that's completely digital, that you don't necessarily have to just control from the waterfront, that you could plug into the cloud, into the internet, um, and control from around the world. Um, I think of a lot of friends of mine, especially during college, who spent hours a day playing you know, World of Warcraft or, or something like that. And you know, they spent all those hours and all they did at the end of the day is they flipped bits. Let's get them to flip rocks. Let's make it so that um, you can log on and drive something around in a place you've never seen before and it's all real. It's all really happening. So that version will have um, a webcam on board and a BeagleBone or other small uh, single board computer. And um, what we've already got working, and Bren, maybe you can talk about this a little later, um, is we have a web server um, that's, that's hosting the ROV's interface from the ROV. So you just log into the IP address of the ROV and the interface comes up um, and you can drive it around. Um, the last feature of this I wanted to talk about is the tether system. And so tethers are sometimes the most challenging part of designing an ROV. Um, if they have to translate a lot of, transmit a lot of power, or they have very thick wires, and if they have very thick wires, they're very heavy, and if they're very heavy, then they need a lot of insulation, which makes them even more thick. And it's kind of this downward spiral of getting thicker and bulkier and harder to, um, to move around in the water. We've come up with this way of using an off-the-shelf part to do data over power line. We can send a 10-base T Ethernet connection to a single uh, twisted pair of stranded wire. Um, so this is 28-gauge wire. And, um, and that's, all, and that's all you need in order to communicate. Um, we've tested it to about 220, I'll use the, the unit feet, although I'd rather say 60 meters. Um, and, uh, and so that's something that we've been working on. Um, I'm trying to work on the good plug for it now. Let's see if I can just turn this on to keep you guys kind of demo. This is going to blind some of you, but these are the lights. They're actually at low battery right now, so they get even brighter. And then, okay. Um, so you'll see one thing that's a, a problem we initially noticed is that the, the batteries that are supplying both the motors and the lights with power, when you drive the motors, the voltage goes down, so the lights turn off. So if I press forward, the lights turn off, and then they slowly come back on as the transient is fixed. We came up with a way to fix that using a supplementary 9-volt battery, which 
tell you guys more about in electronics, but certainly electrical people um, who want to look at what we've designed and the whole big idea is this is crowdsource. All of the designs for this electrical and hardware and software are made available to everyone for free and the idea is that smart people who know what they're talking about, like me, can go through and say, no, 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 that's all wrong. Here's the right way to do it. So really you guys are the ones that we're hoping will, will kind of be able to help us. So that's kind of the overview. Um, I guess just stopping there, are there any questions? Are there any things that I missed? Oh, so right. I'll make sure you repeat the questions. Oh, yeah. Um, he asked, uh, how do we communicate to the ROV? He asked if we use Wi-Fi. Um, we don't. Uh, unfortunately, communicating wirelessly through water, especially at high bandwidth, is nearly impossible. If we were just controlling the ROV around without getting live video, it might be possible to do it with low-frequency RF or acoustics or light. Um, but um, when you start using video, you need higher bandwidth, higher, higher frequencies, higher frequency RF is attenuated in water very quickly. So the answer is no. Um, we actually have this tether that goes all the way up to the surface, and um, we have a little adapter that allows us to plug Ethernet into one end of this little box, and it has a way of um, communicating that Ethernet data over this twisted pair. And then we have another one of those boxes on board that converts it back into Ethernet, which talks to the Google phone. So if it is, the ROV is, I've designed it to go to, um, We've designed it to go to 100 meters depth. Um, we've only tested it to about 20 meters so far, which is still pretty good. Um, and it didn't leak at all. It seemed like it was doing fine. I'll tell you, if we get to you know, 75 meters or 50 meters and it starts to fail, that's a really happy problem to have to deal with. Like, I look forward to having that as a concern. Yeah. Um, it's a lot against uh, uh, what I should say, yeah, it's uh, so well, one of, the, one of the things I'm working on or would like to work on, I spoke to David and Eric about this, is uh, an emergency ballast system. Uh, so that if that tether breaks, it inflates a balloon and brings the ROV back to the surface. Now that's assuming you're in open water. If you're inside a boat, a submerged ship, inside a cave, that obviously isn't going to work. Uh, so, I mean, right now, we don't have a solid answer yeah. for that, but we're looking at how to address that thus. Yeah. Yeah, and there's a lot of cool stuff on the software realm. I mean, in most big cases, people will be in open water, so you can have a very simple program on board. Remember, we have onboard batteries and onboard processing, like a lot of other ROVs. So, for instance, if you lost your connection, you could just say, thrust up with all the remaining battery power you have. And then later on, it's really cool with computer vision is we can even do a, a breadcrumb trail where we say, this is the path we've taken. If we lose calm, turn around, look for the same features, and navigate yourself back. These are things that we hope people who have cool ideas, and like yeah. Tony's idea as well, will come up and, and try out. Um, so we're getting the basic one out there and taking it from there. Exactly. Well, I, I think the, sort of the robot itself is uh, sort of, you know, you, you can lose it. I think there's a lot of things like that, like the emergency re recovery balance system, I think it's a great idea. I also think you know, we haven't built the, the depth sensor, or so like the pressure sensor for the depth or compass settings yet, which I think are going to be you know, kind of higher priorities um, on the, in the development pipeline. Um, but it's all, it's all something that we can, we can work on. Yeah. Right now, the, the ROV doesn't have any onboard pressure sensor or compass, but it's very easy to add those. We just literally haven't had the time on it. But I think that we'll be able to do some really cool autonomous stuff. Yeah, I wonder if the case, like, if it gets, like, stuck, like, extension. Yeah, I think there's options. I mean, this is I, this is the part actually that gets me really excited because um, I'm looking forward, and we're just about there now to the point where you know we have an ROV on a desk like this and a computer here, and 
I can write little bits of software that work with any bit of hardware on board. So I already told you about the idea of, oh, well, the basic thing would be we just press up if we lose comp, but why don't we strobe the lights on board, too, to make it more visible to someone who's looking for it. At some point, you know, we have to just say, well, sounds like you lost the RV, but, you know, better than a human, I guess, if you're exploring should. Um, yeah, it's good. Uh, other questions? We're also yeah. uh, oh, yeah. hoping, you know, these kind of ideas brought out by the community, like people like you, you'll start to implement them yourself back in the So that's why we have you know, a powerful one for years, you know, and as they get more powerful, we'll see possibly something that you can do. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing to remember is that at maximum depth, 100 meters is 328 feet. Uh, anyone here, I've probably got the most I've experienced of anyone, and you know, PADI certification, NAWI certification, only certifies you to 130 feet of depth. So you, this thing will go twice as deep as you can as a diver, so recovery at depth on board a ship is going to be difficult, unless you've got a commercial dive license you're going to be diving trimix, surface applied. It's going to be more expensive for that recovery operation, you know, for that one diver to go down than the unit itself. But again, it'd be a cool uh, situation. Uh, yeah. It's still doable. Yeah. It's still doable. Have you guys seen um, Go See This by James Cameron? It's oh, a documentary he made after doing filming Titanic. He went back and made a documentary about Titanic. And he had these two ROVs that he deployed from manned submarines that were outside of Titanic. And these smaller ROVs, actually, I, of some of the aspects of this ROV I, I, I designed after that kind of theme, how those ones were designed. Um, he would deploy these two smaller ROVs out of the manned ones to go into Titanic and explore and go down the hallways that have not been, you know, looked at for 80 years at the time of this film. Um, and uh, spoiler alert, I guess. Uh, at some point, one of the ROVs gets stuck, and he spends the next three dives using the second ROV to try to recover it. And at the end, they design on the ship this thing with like a coat hanger and this little like hook, and they drive the other ROV down and like spear the first one that's stuck and drag it out of the Titanic. Like anyway, I, it's really cool. These recovery missions, I think, are really neat. And that. I think it's yeah. a perfect segue. I don't know if this, this will come up, but um, so we have a list on our website. We have a list of all the serial numbers, so everybody who has an ROV, um, we, we're keeping track of them and where they are. So this is kind of an opportunity for you to call up your, your neighbor who's working on an ROV and say, hey, I got stuck down in here. Can we go down there and try and find it? So to kind of, you know, doing that rescue operation that Eric talked about with other members of the community. Yeah. So what Jim's uh, good question. Um, Jim's referring to this recent mission. Some of you guys saw we played the video a little earlier. We went to um, Florida Keys to work with. Oh yeah. So this is. Let me start first. I built the first ROVs and have them in my house and. This is actually a build night, and we need to figure out who has what ROV. You might have one. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, anyway, we're listing all the serial numbers and where those ROVs are located. Um, so right. I mean, I think it would be really cool eventually to have, like, dive logs for each of the ROV, you know. And a map. Just number everybody number uh, 40, um, owned by Stephen Olson, has dived in this place, and, you know, this, um, this many dives, these kind of conditions, and these are the cool things that's discovered. I mean, there's a really cool way of kind of just collecting all the different histories of the ROVs that are out there. Um, by the end of this month, there will be more than 100, I think, out there. Um, so Jim was referring to a mission we just went on. Um, we we uh, were invited by NASA to go to the Florida Keys, the Aquarius um, underwater habitat. Um, now, this is me, like, trying to multitask and, and show multiple things at the same time. Do you want a multi to multi yeah. Oh, no, just for pictures of what it looks like or anything. If I were showing a one person, I'd be like Googling things and showing them images as I talk. But um, basically, we went to this underwater sea lab. Yes, there is one. It exists. It's in the Florida Keys in Key Largo. Um, run by NOAA, it's this kind of RV-sized underwater module that aquanauts live on for like several weeks at a time. Um, and they were doing a, a space mission analog where these people living on this underground sea lab pretending like that was a space mission and having to deal with that sort of stuff. So um, we were invited to drive the ROV around um, in the water there. This is the open ocean. 
It's um, about 20 meters deep at that point uh, on the coral reefs. Um, and, uh, you know, it's real ocean conditions. We had swells, we had current, it was salt water. Um, we drove for two days, um, we were deployed. And um, the second day was really a big one after the Aquarius module. We went to a depth of 20 meters or about 60 feet. Um, and um, the ROV performed pretty well. The tether, um, some, at one point I was being clumsy and I let way too much tether out. And there were scuba divers swimming around the ROV. And they were saying that, you know, they could see the tether spooled way out. Because it's so thin, the drag wasn't too much. Uh, or uh, the weight wasn't too much, but the drag from the current, you know, eventually accumulates. And so even even with this thin tether, I mean, you know, if you get enough of it out there, it does start to, it does create um, something they have to work with. Yeah, I was thinking that like at some point, when you have uh, yeah, I mean, some of the other things, you'll actually be able to capture the tether and then it mm-hmm. you can probably control how much you want to put it out. Yeah, just in there. You know, and the other thing, the other thing that came up that uh, was, um, you see the GoPro right there. That, that was something we had used as flotation, and it eventually became more and more waterlogged. So that, uh, that affected the buoyancy. Yeah, and it wasn't just waterlogged. You know, if you guys are scuba divers, you'll be familiar with this effect. If you have anything that's compressible, that, that can change in volume, the deeper you go, the more it compresses, the less water it displaces, so the less buoyancy you have. So um, I, I've gone free diving, for instance, to have a full lung of air at the top I'll swim down and I'm, I'm positively buoyant. If I just stop, I can start floating at the surface. But after I go down to a certain depth because the water pressure is pushing me inward, I suddenly become negatively buoyant and I start sinking. So a piece of foam is the same way. There's a certain point where if you had foam that floats, if you brought it low enough, it would start to sink. And what? Yeah. I, you guys may have seen these foam cups that have been to really great depths. It's like a normal sized foam cup. It looks like a thimble. <laughs> Um, you had a question back. Yeah, so um, I'll give you guys an example of what tether management is usually like. <laughs> um, something like that. I mean, you, with a reel like this, it's not too bad. Of course, once we're plugged into um, once we're plugged into an Ethernet cable, you know, we have to worry about it twisting, but um, what Jim Trezzo was just talking about and, and other ideas is, you know, it would be very easy to design and implement some sort of automatic reel system. You can use a, 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 a slip plate that allows you to conduct wires through a rotating joint. Um, uh, and, I, I, you know, we've had ideas that we've tossed around also, of, you know, if this is going to be internet capable and just plug into a Wi-Fi router, what if we made like a pontoon boat that the, the pontoons are on either side of the ROV and you can remote control it to somewhere and then deploy the ROV down from that. So um, I think there's a lot of options there. I think eventually you I disagree. Um, and actually, I, well, it's interesting. It's a good discussion to have. Um, there's, there's this chart I've made. I, I haven't put up on the internet yet, but fiber optic is something we looked at a lot. I, I think the points you have here are, are really good. Um, that I imagine you're thinking of. One is that it's, it's close to neutrally buoyant and it's very thin, it can handle high bandwidth. But the problem is that if we, if we want to make this, you know, continue to make it low cost, um, if, if you have to adapt uh, fiber optic to something that a normal computer can understand, like Ethernet or, or USB, it's very challenging. And if, if fiber breaks, it's very hard to return it. I, I realize I kind of respond with, I disagree, and I, I guess what I really mean is, I think that it's really hard to do for, for the model we're doing. Yeah. But if someone wanted to do a really legitimate science mission where they need that kind of bandwidth um, and they really need it to be very thin, actually, I don't disagree. That's, that's good. But we explored it a lot and it's really, it was really challenging to implement that on this kind of open source, yeah. um, you know, hobbyist level. Yeah. I have a question for you. I always ask you about sensors. You sort of answer that you want to sensor. Yeah. Sure. Um, so the main two are heading and depth, um, which is compass and pressure. Um, the heading is really easy. There are a bunch of little chips that are available on the order of 10 or $20 that can sense um, magnetic fields and even in three axes give you uh, compass heading. 
Um, the second one is depth, and we looked at a lot of different pressure transducers that can handle salt water. And it seems like the best one is really designed for what we're doing. It's the um, pressure transducer that you find on a dive computer watch. Um, those can be had on the order of about $30 with some non-trivial electrical connections. And so our goal is um, to have it so that would be mounted either on the end cap or on a little module that, that fits in the forward part of the ROV. Um, then there's other things that I think are kind of important secondary sensors. Um, uh, salinity, pH, um, temperature obviously is a really big one. Um, and, and kind of the list starts going on to more specific things related to you know, bathymetric studies. Um, one thing I want to point out if I didn't show it before is that um, a big feature of the ROV is this payload module. You guys will see on the bottom that there's these two bars which are kind of structural, but there's actually holes for four of them. And those holes are 50 millimeters apart and they hold an M5 threaded rod. And our, our hope is that um, people will design payloads that can fit onto these threaded rods, whether that be a robot arm or a metal detector or some sort of bathymetry set or, I don't know, harpoon gun. I don't officially condone that. Um, <laughs> then you can put that here and it's, it's really close to the center of buoyancy. You can look down at it with the camera. Um, yeah, yeah. I think in Florida there, didn't you tell me about it? Yeah, it was cast away. Oh, yeah. It's in the photos. So I guess the idea is you could take a science patch and Right, so there's a couple ways to go there. This is a good example. So this was a totally self contained unit. There's a bunch, you know, there's several options there. Um, I, it's, it's really easy to make an end cap that has however many wires coming in and out when you build the end cap. Basically what we have is this, this end cap that has a circle in it. We pass wires through that circle and then we pot. We fill the circle with potting compound and that's the waterproof bulkhead. So if you had a special cable, you'd have it come out. But what other people have brought, I think Jim, you brought this idea. Um, yeah. I think regular people actually so you could have you could have something, for instance, that just pushes up against the acrylic here. Yeah. yeah. So it could be Bluetooth or XB or, or whatever. Um, so there's a lot of options there. It kind of depends on what the payload is. Um, the interesting back point. Uh, so this is this little sensor that has temperature, salinity, pH, the kind of normal things you want to study. And the scientist on the mission, with the, he just had it laying around. You know, I was telling him about this payload module. He's like, oh, would well, this fit? Like, sure. He's like, well, it's just this cheap thing. You know, this sensor payload. Um, it's like this kind of really low-end, low-cost science package that costs about like five thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. Right. Really, but I mean, he was like, oh yeah, it's just this little five K thing. I mean, that's that's five ROVs. So the payload we were carrying is actually, you know, half an order of magnitude. You know, but I just thought that's cool. So d just to take a quick step back, I mean, I think that the theme of all of the answers is that it, yeah, a lot of this stuff is possible, and we're just kind of move, we're moving in that direction. But the, the goal that we've always kind of had is we just want to make this thing good enough to get out there and, and get folks like you working on it, like ha these ideas, and 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 have an open RV and just go crazy with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. No, exactly. It's, yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, it's it's eight C batteries, um, and we find that we have about an hour to an hour and a half of drum time, depending on use. Um, depending on what kind of chemistry we use in the future, if we upgrade to lithium technology, we can get a lot more. Um, if we trickle charge through the tether, then we can actually close the power budget. Um, right now, on average, I estimate it hasn't been tested extensively that we're at about three amps um, nominal current drop, and so. For instance, if we increase the voltage and decrease the current, a tether like this might be able to trickle charge on board C batteries. And Jim, Jim's been spending a lot of time, uh, you know, thinking about this. I don't know if you have anything you want to chat. Yeah. So, so, so far, the, the precise power measurement, right? And then also, in terms of what we're doing, but the like, the actual location and the state of the world, picture, you're not using all the power. Um, so, there's a couple of technologies. So. There's a power level we're looking at, which typically you can get 18 watts, 30 watts, if you push it, and that's using 50 volts. And you go to five, and you get that kind of gear. The problem there is being two pair or one. Yeah. Some of the odds are not four pair, but you get about two pair. 
So uh it's a little thicker. Although I think for my my depth that might be okay. Yeah. Uh, then with I want to experiment a little bit, there's another standard called Ethernet over power line. And this one is sort of called on the other day. But uh, the idea there is that you just plug the Ethernet and it runs over your regular AC power in the house. Right. So you don't want to, I don't want to run 110 volts to the one of the same and do that. Do that. Other devices would be okay with that. Uh, so we want to experiment with running that at a lower AC voltage, at a lower safe voltage. Then you probably can get a lot of power. Uh, the other challenge with pushing power down the pedal is the thickness of the cable, you know, goes by how much current. So, and more voltage, you get more power out of less current, those are trade offs. Mm -hmm. But somebody's going to put this in the swimming pool with their kids tonight, and it should be safe. Yeah, those Ethernet over power adapters are great, but. You know, we yeah. 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 So that's mo that's a the the question was what are we most focused on right now? So I think that yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. I think that's it's several fold, right? So there's hardware, software, uh, kind of the website and the platform and uh, things like that. Just, you know, fulfilling all these Kickstarter, Kickstarter orders is a really, really high priority. Um, but so that's a, a multifaceted question. So maybe we can just kind of go yeah. down the line. But, I mean, get one that's good enough out into the hands of people. Yeah. That's, if we can get yeah. to that point, I mean, we're, we've been trying very hard to make to advertise our Kickstarter in a way that people realize that what they're getting is they should think of this kind of like that the first Apple computer, you know, that was made out of wood. I mean, there, there will probably be some bugs. There will be things that aren't perfect, but you should. We want people who can who can take that and say, okay, this is a start. It's good enough. It works. But how can we make it better? And once that happens, if we can get a good enough version out to the public, then people will start making it better. They'll start giving us feedback. And that's that's where it catches. I think that's where all it's already happening. Yeah. Yeah. And we're all getting. You gotta walk through some of the building materials you have is pretty close. Yeah. You kind of walk through that, and then you basically have a, a little price point platform that can be extended. And, and you have, uh, I guess, the goal is to have the software running both on the Arduino and the front motors and a couple of sensors. Basically, the legal bone. Which gives you vision of the surface, and you can be able to control that vision of the surface. And that's the basic first thing. Yeah, so that's so actually one of the biggest problems right now is energy. So that's the thing that we're sending to answer your question directly. Tether is the thing that we like most right um, We have to be able to have a strong connection uh, because the software, like, it works, you know, if you plug it directly, and the hardware works. I mean, you saw it working now, which is great. But yeah, so there's this uncertainty that is really the hardest part. Um, like Jim mentioned, there's a lot of options, and actually I'm going to pull up a, um, a thing I've made of different tether options. But right now we're, we're quite certain that we want to use this little 9 volt battery sized box that you plug Ethernet in and it has some RLC circuit which allows you to plug in twisted pair and that communicates tether um, for Ethernet. Um, we're not sure if that's going to work. Yet. Oh, yeah, yeah, there we go. So, yeah. So, we, we've tested this in air to, um, to about 60 meters in length, but we're unsure whether if we go in water because the inductive properties will change because the surrounding substrate changes that will change the performance. And maybe we can mitigate that problem if we detect it by changing the RLC circuit internal. But we don't know what will be entailed there. There's other options happening in parallel with what Jim's developing. There's Ethernet over power, which is great. You can actually go all the way up to 85 or now, I guess, 200 megabits. But it's dangerous if it's not done properly. Um, so. I guess it's the uncertainty that we're most unsure of. 
and brands done an excellent job kind of writing into the software ways of, of you know, being fairly robust, We're working on ways of making it so that if you drop a connection that it's reestablished. Um, but that kind of fuzzy area where we're trying to communicate lots of bandwidth down two wires is it's just really uncertain. Uh, yeah, Mark. I'm sorry, the manufacturing of what? Yeah. Yeah. So we we so the the question is who's manufacturing and uh, assembling these kits and and the answer is us. I mean it's really not that many at this point. Um, so we're going to do that uh, primarily here at Tech Shop um, and then through some the manufacturing of the boards is done uh, this company called Circuit Co. Who does the same company that does the uh, the ball. Yeah. Excited, not concerned. <laughs> well, yeah. What was the question? Yeah. So that yeah, this is a really good question. The question was for people in uh, Europe: <laughs> How long does it take to build one of these kits? And first, you ask first you ask you know who's building it. And we said we're going to be building it here at Tech Shop. If we build six a day and we have 120 orders initially, we can do it in 20 days. Um, so. I just kind of said six a day. That seems reasonable for assembling kits. If you actually want to build one, there are these designs that you should be able to assemble it on the order of like a weekend. Um, you know, if you're under if you're under 15, you know, then maybe a weekend. If you're over 15, then maybe two weekends. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, the whole thing goes together really fast. Yeah, here's I've been kind of doing putting together what we think a kit will look like. And this is missing all the electronics, but you start out with a bunch of plastic parts. These are just laser cut acrylic parts. Um, and a few of you guys have assembled these, Jim, and uh, I, you guys, I guess, have at least cut the parts. And Tony's for one. It, it doesn't take more than maybe a few hours to assemble the, the actual plastic structure. Um, and I think what's really time consuming when you, when you start putting it together, by comparison, is you know, you have to you have to re-solder new leads onto the motors. Um, you, there's some soldering to make the right connectors for electric speed controllers. Um, but yeah, in general, I'd say on the order of build it on a weekend or just over the course of a week is is reasonable if you're aggressive. Um, kind of our, our motto is, you know, I picture this being something that you know a father of son team could build and use in their pool, but that would still be capable of doing legitimate scientific research. And that's kind of where we got to that. That's a big problem and it's a big concern of us. His, uh, his question was, there's a lot of things on Hobby King that people have to order um, for supply chain. For instance, Hobby King is out, is back ordered on some things. Um, how do we deal with that? We're, yeah, so we're, we're working on getting more reliable supply chain for the parts that we use. Um, and right now, you know, we're kind of telling people where we get it from. Um, and if we can build, you know, this like a wholesale agreement with them or something and, and get more ourselves, we might be able to explore possibilities of ourselves here just having a really large inventory to help out. In the Not really that. large, but like large enough to manage. You know, large enough to send some stuff out. So it's a concern. I mean, I think it's a concern whenever you're using off-the-shelf parts that they'll just run out. I've been kind of curious if the reason Hobby King now keeps on running out of the parts that we use that they didn't use to before is maybe there's a lot of people building these that we don't even know about. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going to try to find ways of making that more reliable. That's just where we happen to get them now, and that's you know, that's where we're spending a lot of time. Yeah. 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 The ESCs I'm not as concerned with because of the same reason you say. I mean, like there's so many out there that if we needed to, we could switch out for another one. The motors that we're using, particularly the ones that we're using, are, are kind of designed specifically, or I should say open RV is designed specifically to use those. They're, the distance between where the, the mounting bolt head and the propeller is is you know, specific, and it's a low KV motor. There are probably some that would work, and actually we're hoping that once people start getting these, they'll maybe adapt them to, to others. Um, but that's, I'd say the motors particularly are the ones that are the biggest concern if they run. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you 
perhaps like one that provides a higher degree of reliability but less performance. So it would be like a thicker tether that has more wires or, or that's twisted more accurately? Well, well the idea is that, you know, yeah, exactly. it, it might come in handy, you know, sure. you know, one of your communications would be that tether. You know. So yes, so what Eric's looking at right here, and it's, he's trying to get oh, this okay. on the screen, is, is the whole thought process behind all the different tether options and, and, and all the different alleys we've explored and and where they've led and, and kind of leads. But yeah, there's a ton of a ton of different things that we could do and can change and can can interchange. Yeah. I'm wondering if you guys could talk about um, some of those design hurdles that you have <laughs> work on because it's a pretty uh, spectacular area. I'm really curious, especially around putting electronics on the air and Yeah. You know, uh, whether it's software or hardware if you guys can talk about it. Uh, yeah. Brandon, you want to start out with software issues you had? Uh, well, it's all been a learning process for me, so every time. <laughs> uh, uh, the biggest uh, block at first was big, we were running on the time and so on. We so were just trying to get it on a different video on the day, and we couldn't get it two hours. So, I mean, there's been, there's been lots of hurdles, but nothing. Um, Yes. Well, what if, so like on a Beagle loan, for example, we've tested on A3, A4. Uh, oh, yeah, I, just, all I just got A6 boards in this week, and Ubuntu won't install on A6. Mm -hmm. On newer versions of the board, that's what we spent two hours working on. So, but Angstrom works. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're just trying to figure out those types of issues. And then um, on the hardware side of things, um, definitely, I think mean, there's, there's too many issues to list. It's, it's, I guess I always kind of laugh when you're, you're saying, so what, you know, what hurdles have you reached? I mean, every single thing you look at at one point was designed wrong. Um, certainly OpenRV has been a project of kind of like failing our way to success. Um, I didn't bring it today, but we started out, you know, when I, like, when I first started designing these kind of out of fun before David came and was saying, hey, let's make this bigger. Um, it was, it was completely wrong. There were these two small tubes that weren't really big enough to fit any electronics. And then even worse, there was a connecting tube, so anything that was in this tube that had to be wired that tube, you couldn't pull it out unless you unplugged the wire. Um, it was kind of this process of, of figuring out what, what's the most annoying, fixing that until it's not annoying anymore, and then moving to the next. Um, I believe that we got to serial number 24 before it, the curve kind of started tapering out. Um, in my garage, there's this huge line of failed ROVs of trying to build them, and it just that yeah, dimension wasn't right. Um, I, yeah, there's yeah. been there was a lot of, there was a lot of afternoons at swimming pool going, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'd actually say that one of the, the things that I think it was the, was the biggest was the most eureka moment for me, like when Eric came and told me that he that he figured out that he could strip heat this acrylic and bend it. Because up until that point, we were connecting it and dealing with the connectors of, uh, of having to fold and, and like having to. We were gluing these two pieces of acrylic end to end and trying to fasten that way. And there's a lot of options there. You can kind of do these dovetail things, or you can just straight glue it. But it would always crack. You have a stress concentration anytime you have a, a brittle point. And so that was that was one that. I mean, I, I still remember when we went to we actually went out and had Thai food that night. He goes, you know, I want I want to show you something. And he pulled this little. It was like a little miniature ROV. But he had folded it. He just wanted to see if it worked. And he goes, look at this. This is like this. I'm thinking about doing it like this. And it was from there, like it just started, everything just started kind of snapping into place. And it's just gotten cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And um, yep. yeah, so that, that I still remember that dinner very, very vividly. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, there's, I, have, I, carry, I always carry a sketchbook. Um, and when I'm on a train or something, I have an idea. I start drafting out you know, the diagrams of how something ought to look. Um, and so I have just pages and pages of what, just trying to figure out what the form factor is and how we can fit everything together. A lot of it has been learning. I mean, I really like to push this as building these, if you're like me, it's a great way to learn. I, I, I've never done well in school, you know, because it's like people are saying, well, this is how you do it. But like, an example I like to think of a lot is just the end caps. They seem so simple. They're just, they're just end caps, you know. Um, I didn't realize why O-rings were better designed than gaskets. Um, you see in all these deep pressure vessels that instead of having gaskets, they have O-rings. And, and 
I kind of figured it out by looking online and just examining it. But the way it works is if you're looking at the cross section of this of this end cap, it has these two grooves in it. Those are called glands. And the O-ring, we're looking kind of at the side. The O-ring has a circular cross section. It fits in that gland, kind of between that between the groove and the other plate, the inside of the tube. And so as pressure is added up, that O-ring is pushed kind of inside of that crack more and more. And so the more pressure there is, the more it seals. And it took me a while to realize that that was the reason we kept on leaking at really shallow depths, but once we went deeper, everything was fine. It seems like, oh, we're deeper, there's more pressure, that's when we'll leak. No, you're most likely to leak at the surface. And then there was another thing I figured out from that, which was, um, you know, when we're pushing these O-ring end caps together, we're compressing the air. And so the air pressure inside of the pressure vessel wants to push the O-ring back out the other way. It's pushing the wrong way against that interface. So then what happens is it initially is holding, it's holding water out because, you know, it's seated. But now as you go down in depth, the pressure starts to equalize. And then the O-ring at, you know, one or two meters depth is just floating in the middle, and that's when you leak. And we started noticing this in testing. So this whole process of learning that hands-on and then kind of having to design a way out of that, what we ended up coming up with was instead of using metal dowel pins concentrically to make these O-rings, we just got medical syringes, like you know, if you get an injection at the doctor's. You get medical syringes and you cut the end off. And we came up with this way where you just pull out this little syringe from a, from a this little plunger from a syringe after you put the end caps together. And Brian, you and I have done it a bunch of times. There's this kind of sound. And what that is is all the compressed air from pushing the end caps together, you've now let that out. The O-ring is now floating in the middle, and it'll immediately start seeding when you go down. So that was really long-winded, but like that's an example of what this whole process has been like. Would you could vacuum it out. So that would be great. If you could pre-seed the O-ring. So, and I'm, I'm looking into it. So I, I want to just add one thing to that. So I told a the quick story about the fold for you know using the strip heater to fold it. Eric actually found out about that from another member at TechShop. So they have a strip here here. Not many people use it for anything, actually. And someone, so another member at TechShop is saying, you know, why don't you just fold it? Or he was folding acrylic or something like that. So it's this idea of a lot of brains working on this, right? And, yeah. and just being at TechShop and working together around other people who have tried different things and experimented, um, this idea of doing, doing this together. So it's not, I don't like to call it a DIY project. I like to call it a DIT project. So we're doing this together. Because I think the more minds we have working on this, the easier these pro these problems are going to get solved. You know, it's because some it's. Yeah, Wena versus silicone versus. Yeah, for O rings, there's these these Parker tables that you have to use to figure out how the pressurizing works. And I'd love to say that I use those Parker tables and use those precise numbers, and that's what we ended up with. I, I stepped to the Parker tables, tried it out, and it just didn't feel right. So ultimately, I ended up just kind of yeah. playing with it until it worked. Yeah. The question was, do I keep an ongoing project? Well, do we keep an ongoing project? Well, the best of all of us is probably Bram, who, during your software development, you've been really good at. at One thing that we haven't mentioned yet. Is Everything posted on GitHub, all of our source code, um, like CAD files or whatever. I'm not exactly sure what that is. And to Tony is completely whipping us into shape on being better on documentation and um, and all that stuff. So that's that's all improving as well because we get a lot of people are saying, well, you know, we need better like build instructions. And we know and like we're, this is one of many things that we're we're focused on and we're working really hard to to improve. So that was kind of like the reason. Yeah. Um, I, I actually started a slide specifically for your blogs for um, projects, and the goal is that actually, I see it as Twitter is blogging, and that's not my slide, it's documentation, and that room at the same time. And you start out, and it's like, oh, I can do this in 20 seconds. I did this in a small group, but I would find you actually kind of get into the habit of uh, I am using that to use a sort of public key software. Um, I've done that to use it for a very hard time to get out there on the project. And you don't feel like you have to do like you can take a little piece of data just enough for you. If someone else brings it along, and then I go, oh, OK, I can see why they haven't done this program, why they didn't go down this program in two months' time. You go down, why don't you do something like that? 
Um, so yeah, I'd really encourage you to look at just the, the simplest link that, that allows you to come up with on this particular day. Sounds great. Can you please send us send us the link to that? I think that sounds really interesting because you know, not only for us to, to keep track of that, but we just we just showed you that list of all of the different serial numbers and where everyone's building. So I think it'd be cool if what if everyone had their kind of bill log, and so if they said, "Hey, I'm having problems here," you know, someone else on the forums could go in and say, "Hey, well, well, you screwed up there. You should have done this at that point." So yeah, that's in, that's really interesting. Uh, please send us the link and the document. Okay, well, if you send me the link, I can tweet it out from the OpenRB Twitter. Yeah. Uh, on the team, uh, you mentioned that you have a different meeting schedule. Is that something that you want to anticipate? That's a great idea. Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. And, and we were thinking about, um, uh, you know, maybe having like a development call so it's kind of easier for people to do on the move, maybe like a weekly or, or bi-week, you know, uh, every other week kind of development call. The build nights, we're absolutely going to have lots of build nights because, you know, when you're building these ROVs, like some stuff you don't need a lot of, you just need a little bit of. So if we can all share kind of those resources, that's going to be, that's going to be huge. So we're definitely going to build nights and, and, and yes, we're going to get the community together more and, and, and go out and have fun. And of fun. everyone who's here, I guess by show of hands, how many of you guys would be interested or would very likely uh, attend, like, a, let's say, a monthly kind of meetup for people who are working on this? Like, that's pretty good. Like, it's worth it to do that. Well, we, we did our last one at Noise Bridge, and that was great. It was great. It was a, it's, it's a mile away. So right up. Yeah. So I... I Brand and I both live in South Bay. I live in Cupertino, and Brand lives in San Jose. So, I mean, there's Hacker Dojo, there's a tech shop down there, there's my garage, which is where a lot of this is going to go. Yeah. East Bay. Um, I mean, it would be a really happy problem to have that there's so many people everywhere that we have to have multiple build nights. Um, I look forward to yeah. that. I mean, I'm, I'm in Half Moon Bay, 500 yards from the ocean, so build it, drop it in the water, walk back in the house. <laughs> Figure out what's wrong, rebuild it, drop it back in the wall. <laughs> I just um, realized I could have had this up for a bit while I have it up. I want to describe. It. There were questions earlier about tether options, and this is kind of a, a feeble attempt I've made to kind of show what it looks like in my brain, at least, and what the options were. Um, I have several of these charts. This is the one with the orange little explanations. There's another one with green ones that say what the cost of each of these are. There's another one with blue ones that says. Um, what the main features and problems of each of them are. This one, the orange one, says what we've done so far. Um, and basically the route we've taken is, well, we can't do zero wire because acoustic modems are too expensive and um, if we were to those. Oh, okay. oh, yeah, you guys probably can't see it. I, I won't, um, I'm going to make this available in the next two days on the website. But basically we've looked at, you know, with up to four or more wires and what the different options are. And kind of route we've taken is there's a lot more you can do with two wire when you're doing Ethernet data. Um, and within that, it's safest and lowest cost to do it with passive ROC adapters. Um, but what I'm starting to see, and this is what's really cool to me, is people are starting to look at these other options that might be viable and expand. And kind of the way I picture not just the tether issue, but everything, everything involving um, the design of the ROV and even the design community is like, Here's a seed idea. Here's some ways, directions you can go. That's kind of a tree. And from each of those options are some more ways that you can go. And so I think what makes this tree grow is people, right? The more people um, we feed to this, the more of these branches we can kind of expand on. And just like a tree, you know, grows branches where it's getting more light, the ones that are more prosperous, I think, will grow more, more solidly. I'm sure we can kind of go further down. But yeah. Um, I feel like you don't use you don't design something like this unless you're excited to explore. And I'm curious to hear if there's an application that you guys... Yeah, no, in our case, we're really not actually excited about it in any way. So, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, is there a particular application or, you know, you can give us or to, like, explore back to uh, any one of your friends in most of your <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really I, I, yeah, definitely. So I, I, I we can well, before I <laughs> jump out a bit to answer this question. My dream is to go down to uh, uh, Baja 
and, and kind of reenact uh, John Steinbeck's uh, Sea of Cortez trip because, you know, he, he did that, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. And they, you know, they just had really rudimentary tools. And they did all this citizen science stuff and collected samples. I'd like to go down there with an open ROV and all these other, you know, DIY citizen science tools and kind of reenact the journey and write about it. And I think that's, like, that really yeah. gives me excitement. Do you have any specific Yeah, ideas? I mean, I have a little bit of a case story, so it's a case story. Yeah, it's been a question. What's this? Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, all right. All right, well, this is story. Okay, so I've been telling this story since basically one of how, this, how many people have heard the story? Yeah, raise your hand if you've heard the cave story. Mark, of course. Oh, my that's God. it? Okay. Oh, well, we better tell Okay, you. all right. So there's this story, and it was really the impetus for me starting to really build an ROV. I, I heard about it. I'm, I'm going to. I just need to build up energy first. I mean, this is, it's going to take all I've got. Uh, this is going to be an, Okay. So there's this story, and um, it involves, you know, a gold robbery and buried treasure and the Waterfield Cave. Um, are, is that interesting? Or? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so this is a story that I heard from a friend. I've got the whole thing condensed into like a minute and 28 seconds. Um, basically, I was starting to build these ROVs because I was interested and I was looking for an excuse. I, I phoned a friend who knows a lot about this stuff and said, hey, do you know any cool excuses to use an ROV? Um, and he told me this story. I started researching it and um, it ultimately led to me wanting to design this ROV specifically for this mission. Um, okay, so like storytelling stretches. Uh, okay, so here's, here's how it goes. Uh, flashback, mid-1800s, middle of the gold rush, Northern California, two Native American men rob a gold mining operation in Northern California and make away with an estimated 100 pounds of gold before killing two guys they rob. Um, they're on the run, the gold is laying them down and a sheriff posse is gathered to chase after them. So they're trying to get away um, I've seen skeptical looks. This is all a true story. You can find it in stuff. Um, <laughs> so these guys are trying to get away with this gold. There's a sheriff posse behind them, and, and uh, the gold's weighing them down. It's slowing them down. They decide to ditch the gold. And so they do so. They, they ditch this gold way up in the Trinity Alps, and they start making a run for it. The sheriff posse catches up with them anyway um, after a day of, of trying to escape or so, and says, tell us where you hid this gold and will spare your lives. Um, so both men said they hid in a cave called the Hall City Cave in Northern California. Um, so despite the Sheriff Posse's promise, both men were hung on the spot. It's the Wild West, right? Um, and so the Posse goes to this cave, and um, they find it. And reportedly, they go to the very back of it, and they don't find any gold. All they find is this puddle, this water-filled little area of the cave. And in the very back of it, they report seeing this perfectly circular, six foot diameter roughly hole that goes straight down in the water as far as they can see. Presumably the gold was thrown down there with no technology to explore it at the time. They give up. Flash forward, mid-1980s, um, apparently this super pro, you know, treasure hunter guy hears the story and goes to the cave and apparently finds the cave and goes down the hole. And he's doing snubo, just like scuba diving with an air hose that, that delivers air down to you. He goes 50 feet, the length of his coast, and shines his light down and just keeps on going. And he finds these shafts that go up and out to the side um, and tries to score in one of those. At one point, his radiator pulls out of his mouth, and he has to swim, decide whether to swim up and hope there's air or back down the way he came. He does the ladder and goes down 20 feet and back up 30, holding his breath and nearly escapes death. And then flash forward again in the 1990s, apparently these super pro cave divers went even further into the cave. But at the time I heard the story, to that day, no one had ever found the back of the cave and no one had ever found the gold. In fact, we didn't even know if the cave existed. So there's a stand-up, long-winded little bit. That was a story that seemed really interesting to me. What if we can use an RV to explore this place that has never been seen before? It's got danger. It's got treasure. It's got exploration and cool gadgets. Um, so for me, that was the story. So for the record, that was the st first story you told me. Thank you. That was longer than a minute 28. I, I, that was the story you told me when we first met, and I was like, oh, my gosh, we should do that. <laughs> and, um, and so this whole thing has really grown out of that conversation, which is really, really cool. And, and the important thing is that it's not, that's not something the NSF is ever going to fund, right? The, the couple of people who want to go explore this cave. But we were curious, and we wanted to go explore it. And we, and we want to enable, that's been our vision from, from the beginning, is to enable anyone who's just curious or you know, has a little bit of sense of adventure and wants to get out there and do it, that they could be able to do it. And um, we've had so much fun, and, and by far, 
by far the best part about this whole thing has been meeting so many great people and, and having people kind of want to, sh to share that experience. Um, so it's, it's a process and we're not, you know, we're right in the middle. It's not, it's not done. We need your help and we want all of you and everyone online to, um, to contribute and to, and to help us get to the next level. I guess there's that uh, that chef that you're at Sunday Town, some you mentioned yeah. on the list I feel yep. they were sitting down to people when they fled the lake, the whole council went down, all on everything. That's why your feet work. And it's cold to the work. I, I wanna tell you guys about kind of the vision. I mean, we all kind of have our own ideas. Brand has ideas for where we can take the software. And Tony has ideas for how people can contribute and the best way to do that. And David has ideas. Um, and I have ideas. We've all been kind of coming up with these, you know, ways that we want this to grow. And I think ultimately it's going to be kind of organic. It's going to be how the community pushes it. But there's three things in my mind that I, I, I ultimately see as, as kind of where we want to go. Um, and just because the letter, the words work out this way, I, I call them AA, DD, and II. Um, AA is armchair adventures. I picture people being able to, from the comfort of their own home with a hot chocolate in hand, be able to log on and see amazing things that have never been seen before, to go explore and, and, and detect you know, weird species that look weird and kind of like playing a video game, they'd be transported into this mystical world where it's a real adventure, but it's it's achievable and you don't have to suit up or anything like that to do it. That's AA, Armchair Adventures. DD is Daily Discoveries. I think from Armchair Adventures, from being able to just log on and see this um, you know, foreign world and look at things, that we're going to get tons of people who are on a daily basis perhaps um, you know, creating YouTube videos of things they just saw when they were driving their ROV. This crazy squid thing you know, just swam in front of my ROV. What is that? And then get you know scientists on the same forums contributing, saying, "Oh, well, I think it was this type of species. See if you can get another image of that." I mean, we could constantly be getting more science data and exploration data into the cloud for other people to analyze. And the last one is II, which I call intense innovation. Um, just from even the people sitting here, um, Tony founded SourceForge. Tony, uh, 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 Jim has done all this contribution to really advanced engineering work um, with tethers and stuff that we've been doing. The people who are interested in what we're doing are amazing. There are people out there, you know, if you were going to hire them to do the kind of stuff they're doing for fun, they'd be charging hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, but they think that this stuff is cool. And I think by growing this community of people who know their stuff and they're passionate, that we can start developing things that have never been done before. I think that even though OpenROV is kind of a hobby level thing, we're going to be on the brink of technology. So we're going to be right right where the cutting edge is and the things that we can come up with are going to be amazing. So those three things, armchair adventures, daily discoveries, and intense innovation, I think are all achievable through open and that's kind of where I want this to go. Uh, you know, I want to tag something onto that because I, I'm totally on board and, and that's something that, that's evolved at um, many, many conversations and, and I think that's right on. But the thing I would want to tag on is the education aspect. So I've heard from so many educators and teachers at college levels and, and, and high schools and, and even middle school, that this tool would be an amazing tool because it not only is it engineering um, and design, but it's also biology. I mean, you could take this into a pond, you know, behind the school or a lake and, or a river and explore. And I, just thinking back to my education, it wasn't, it wasn't cool. And I, and I want to make, I think that we have the potential to, to really do something cool. It's a cheap tool. It's open source technology. And there's also a community, right? So teaching students how to, how to you know, connect and interact with the global community. So if, if you guys are educators or you know educators, that's something we're always thinking about and always trying to bring up as well, too. So the, the education aspect is huge. I don't think we're there yet, but I think that, you know, why not have one of these in every high school? Or two, or seven. Uh, Yelena? Yeah, I just wanted to ask a little bit. I've been working with you guys a little, and I think that yeah. a lot of the benefits that they describe it from two pictures of the yeah. RV, which is that it's cheap and it's simple. Uh, the fact that it's cheap and it's simple means that average people or uh, inexperienced gray people can get their hands on it. And that opens up many, many worlds. The IAAAB education option. So there are all kinds of applications that people bring to us that we've never heard of or thought of. 
um, that come from the fact that it's cheaper to build. So I had some friends that went to the leaf um, to do conservation work, and they spent a tremendous amount of time at this uh, conservation place just literally counting sea turtles. And they were saying, gosh, if we only had some tool that we could use to you know, remotely monitor these sea turtle populations, but it's too expensive. Like, well, actually, we have a tool that we can use. Um, today at work, I work in a software company. Somebody told me that they heard about the army from a friend of theirs who wanted yeah. to use it to check on the status of his boat. You know, and I think we talked about this at some point, but like just seeing whether it's clean and whether um, there's crap going on the side of the boat. Um, we've been talking to some folks that know of and want to incorporate it in some research that NSF is doing in Indonesia. Um, but also to bootstrap some education programs they have for students there who want to get involved in technology. So literally all ends of the spectrum, um, and, and all of it comes from the fact that it's so simple to get your hands on and it's at a price that uh, most people can afford. And hopefully getting cheaper, right? Like as, as yeah. you know, as these, these embedded systems continue to get cheaper, I mean, we, we want to continue to push that. We want to. It's not just people, too. It's, uh, don't underestimate the education aspect, but I spent eight years in the military as a diver, uh, EOD technician, and then two and a half years as a recovery diver for the police department. Uh, I can tell you I was telling Eric on one dive on Friday uh, where we put eight divers in the water at 190 feet uh, for about six hours, and we risked eight people's lives to recover one body that we weren't even sure was down there, right? So a tool like this would have helped alleviate some of those issues. You know, most police departments can't afford this, yeah. as opposed to a, huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so for robot, I, I love robotics, and I've been doing them for, since before uh, open ROV, but um, they, they're, I love letters. I don't know why. but. Um, I always think of the four Ds of when it's better to send a robot to do it. So if it's dull, dirty, distant, or dangerous, it's probably better to send a robot to do it. That's, that's, that's the four Ds of robotics. Um, and to, to whoever it was credit, I, I think at least three of those I kind of heard from someone else and, and started realizing, like, yeah, that's, I think that's the case. Um, yeah, question in the back. Yeah, his point I think is really good, and I guess for people online who won't be able to hear, he was saying that you know the ocean is very distant and not accessible for everyone. People who are inland can't see it, so making it something that they can actually put in their consciousness is really big. And I completely agree with you. We we hear all about how coral reefs, for instance, are in danger, you know, and the habitats there are, are, are struggling. But I mean, imagine hearing that compared to you know driving an ROV through the internet that's around, and you know where that one hermit crab always hangs out, and then one day it's gone. I mean, suddenly that has a much more tangible effect. Um, so that's a really, really good point. And I think that, especially on the conservation side of things, it's one of the biggest impacts we can have. Uh, so who, who, who wants to build a robotic arm? Someone. Yes. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> Multiple people right there. So that's the first. That seems like the simple thing is just adding a, a, a kind of a gripping mechanism. Um, but I think I think we can we can go a long way and we can do a lot with just even the observations. But yeah. Did yeah. you have specific ideas or thoughts? Okay. Cool. We had a science hack day that this isn't really manipulating the environment, but you know again I think just like our Arduino's have the Arduino Shield. Um, OpenRV has its payload module or its payload bay. Uh, this is something we designed at an Open Science Hack Day, um, actually here at Tech Shop a, a few months ago. And it's a water sampler, so it has these tubes, and I won't put it together now. But basically, when you compress this wire, it causes this tube to, you know, contain a certain pump of water, so you can do water sampling. And this is only the beginning. I, I think that people who have specific needs, they want to manipulate something, they just want to clip a hook onto a boat that they lost. Um, you know, all of those are options. You know, Tony wants to make this little flotation thing that can be used for lifting stuff. I piloted larger ROVs in the past. Like, we went to Lake Tahoe recently once. Um, and uh, I remember every single dive we did, um, within moments of hitting the floor, this big, silty, empty, 
lake floor, we'd immediately start seeing man-made objects, but not the ones that you see rushed up on the side of the freeway, heavy things that couldn't be retrieved, pocket knives and sunglasses and, you know, probably wedding rings, you, you know, and it's just sitting there. It's this big, flat, empty area. So it just sits there and nothing disturbs it. So, I mean, as one example, you could probably make a killing just diving in popular boating areas and retrieving things. Um, I mean, Some, somebody came up to us like, you know what this is going to be? This is going to be a million dollar golf ball retrieval tool. <laughs> you know, people are going to buy one of these and just go in, in ponds by golf courses and just make millions finding golf balls. Like, Maybe, I suppose. <laughs> So, so the possibility is endless, but I really like the, you know, the potential there. So, so it reminds me, so when I was about there, I guess, I caught the tail end of the space program. I worked on a little bit of Apollo stuff. But space is really expensive. And I think they go over and stuff. So the ocean is as complex. I need to create missions. Now, this is sort of the first simple entry level. And all the system software and everything that goes in here is to be expanded. And I'd like this to become a And then there's a lot of really interesting logic stuff. A lot more like some blues out there. So there's something exciting. Oh my God. That's the problem with the space mission, but it's a start by moving by doing the space Stay very small. So um, a random um, thing I just wanted to say while I'm thinking of it. Um, we love showing how many people are involved and everything. Uh, you're thinking it'd be cool to be able to show that this event happened and while everyone's here. Does anyone object if I take a few photos while this is going on and we ended up putting photos and happening on our website? No objections. I'll, I'll do it a little later, but I just wanted to check. And then the, the other thing I want I want to say as we as we close up. Oh, no, no, no. We'll, we'll figure that out. Um, but the other thing I want to just really thank Tech Shop. I don't know if anyone's watching, but thank thank you to Tech Shop because you know they they've been so kind not only to host us tonight but just to put up with Eric and I around the shop and, and always kind of helping us out with whatever we need. They've been, they've been so great. If, if any of you guys are, are interested in what is possible um, at Tech Shop, John's in the back and, and uh, we, we can go on tours. I'm happy, we're happy to you know, show you exactly how the, the RV is made. I don't know if that's... We're going to laser cut to yeah. like nine, right? Yeah. Sure. That's great. That's great. And um, I mean, the, the, the fact of the matter is that what we've done here is, that, you know, Eric and I are just too kids with, don't, with no money. So the only thing, the only way that this is possible is really with, with Tech Shop. Kickstarter now too is a big, is a big uh, enabler, but uh, what, what they've created has is, is really helped us. So um, I just want to really, really thank them. And Nick, also Nick for letting us um, host this on his meetup site. Uh, the San Francisco Hardware Startup Meetup is another awesome event that you guys should all check out too. So. I, I, you know, I think we should just um, we should just end it right here. And if you guys have any other uh, questions, oh, then we can yeah we can yeah, just questions, or just come up and talk to us. Okay. Right? I have one really random question, but we we've been debating this, and you guys, I'm just exploiting you guys. Um, if you guys have seen the Kickstarter, you see that one of our options is a red beanie um, that we're selling. And so we're debating two things. For the logo on the beanie, do we say open ROV, like the, the standard kind of open ROV logo? Or the other option is we're thinking of just using that, that circle that's the O of open ROV that has the bubbles. Um, could I do a show of hands poll really quick? Is that okay with you guys? How many of you guys think that it saying open ROV would be better? Show your hands. And then how many of you guys would prefer it to just be the O that says open ROV? Oh, that's close. <laughs> You know what? That's fine. Eric and I are gonna rock. We're gonna rock paper scissors for it. All right. Cool. We're not right now. All right. There you go. That's a good idea. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you guys all so much. And also online, if you have any other questions, you can email. Thank you guys.